Well, I think you have to be a bit careful. Of course, ExoMars, in a sense, is there already. The ExoMars Trace Gas Orbiter is there and has been there since 2016. So part of the ExoMars program uh, is there and, and doing great science. And in fact, really strange science, right? We're not finding the methane or the other trace gases that we hope to. Um, from uh, orbit, but the Curiosity rover is still seeing it on the ground. So there's a great scientific mystery about whether there's life on Mars and whether methane as a tracer of it is actually it, it is showing us where that might be. But of course, the ExoMars rover, the Rosalind Franklin rover, is something else. And sure, it's very frustrating. Um, the coronavirus pandemic didn't play, uh, you know, us good cards. It's a ExoMars is a very international project, so it spans European Space Agency and Roscosmos, and parts of the rover and the surface platform and the carrier, they all come from different places. And there was a point in spring last year where you just you couldn't move bits and pieces around. Um, also, we were having problems with parachutes. Um, the uh, supersonic parachutes were getting ripped during deployment. We think we've conquered that now. We've done tests where they deploy well, but that uh, plus some software problems and the hardware problems moving around, I think it was just a wise decision not to try and fly last summer. Um, because, you know, the, if there's one thing worse than ExoMars, uh, the ExoMars rover not making it to the surface of Mars in 2021, it's crashing in 2021. Um, and so I think we made the right decision in delaying for a couple of years. The key thing that the ExoMars Rosalind Franklin rover has, which no previous rover has had, not even Perseverance and Curiosity, is a two meter long drill. Uh, and that will allow us to go two meters under the surface of Mars, looking for samples, bringing them back up, and then putting them into this amazing analytical laboratory on board, and look for signs of life, whether that's life from the past, uh, in the deep geological past of Mars, or maybe life in the present. Now, why is that two meters important? Why is it not just enough to go and scratch on the surface, uh, pick up some samples and analyze those? Well, they might have some signs of organic life in them, but Mars is a very hostile environment. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, just 1% the density of Earth's atmosphere. And that allows radiation to come from space. Uh, that's ultraviolet light and cosmic particles and it sterilizes the surface of Mars completely. So it would be really hard for any kind of form of life that we know of to survive on the surface of Mars. It's also even signs of old life, organic molecules, chains, carbon chains, they get broken by this radiation. And so it's just a much better thing to do to go deeper underground. But of course it's working alongside the other rovers as well. They're all complementary. We're going to a different location than the other rovers. and. Mars is such a strange dead planet today, you know, maybe life didn't get started everywhere and didn't survive everywhere. So actually it's important to go to multiple locations as well. And I think that's something people forget. You don't just go to one place uh, and find all the answers about a planet. We know that from the planet Earth. Well, the scientific community are always very interested in Mars from, from different angles. People think it's always about life. It's always about the search for, uh, you know, s signs left over from when Mars was much younger. But as we've seen working with our um, European colleagues uh, at the DLR and CNES and other places, France and Germany, um, there's a lot to be learned about the interior structure of Mars. So uh, recent results just to, uh, in the last week or so have begun to show us what the interior of Mars is like. So, so there's lots and lots of reasons to go to Mars. Um, but when you do go back to that core question about looking for life, the one thing, the step beyond the ExoMars rover that we're already working on, we're already building hardware, is sample return. So bringing parts of Mars actually back to Earth and putting them in much, much bigger laboratories, much bigger scientific instruments, big accelerators, for example, which you could never send to Mars. So for that, you need to bring that material back. Now, Mars Sample Return is a collaboration with NASA, between NASA and the European Space Agency, and it will be a multi-step process. And in fact, it's already started because the Perseverance rover, which uh, landed earlier this year, 
has already taken its first sample. It'll put them in small canisters and then at some point later in the mission we'll leave all of those canisters on the surface. So Mars Sample Return will be a spacecraft that takes us all the way to Mars, a lander which goes down to the surface, uh, a rover which then goes out and picks up those small tubes, those small hermetically sealed samples, and that will be a European uh, rover, brings them back and then sort of the audacious part, if you like, is launching back into space with a rocket from the surface of Mars. And then equally audacious is catching the sample container, kind of a, a sphere with all of those little samples inside, transferring that to a, an orbiter which will be European again and that will then return to Earth and then that, that sphere will then enter the Earth's atmosphere and will pick the samples up. So that program's already started, we're spending lots of money on it, we're building lots of hardware already. So even though we haven't got ExoMars launched yet, we're on to the next step. Uh, and they all work together, they're all in complement together, so Mars Sample Return doesn't replace the ExoMars rover, it's all part of this program about understanding the Red Planet. The aim is to do it by the end of this decade, so the end of the 20s. And of course, everybody knows that you can only go to Mars every two years. That's when the planets are properly lined up, Earth and Mars, to make for the quickest and, let's call it, cheapest journey, not using a huge rocket. So the aim could be to do it in t to launch in 2028. That means the samples from Perseverance will be on the surface for a long time. Um, but if we go in 2028, then we could bring those samples back uh, by the end of this decade. We're certainly working on it, we're building stuff and that's what we're aiming for, but everybody knows things in spaceflight sometimes get delayed. So we'll see, there's no, there's no kind of hard deadline, Mars will be there and the samples will be there. Well it's an interesting question because one place which I I'm, I'm a bit concerned about sometimes when people talk about Mars is that people extrapolate too far. Mars, we think, when it was younger, was much warmer, had a much thicker atmosphere and was wet. What we don't really know yet is whether Mars was wet for very long periods of time, whether it had oceans over billions of years, or whether it was periodically wet. Um, one of the things people forget about Mars or, or don't realise is important about the Earth is that we have a moon, we have a very big moon, and that moon keeps our polar axis fairly stable. Mars lacks a big moon, it has the two small moons, Phobos and Deimos, but those are basically captured asteroids, so they don't have the same gravitational influence on Mars that, mo that our moon has on us. So the Martian orbit, uh, its, its, its rotation and its polar axis actually tilt significantly over its lifetime. And that means that the, the places which were the poles then get closer to the equator and ice melts and shifts around and maybe creates running water for periods of time. Um, but we don't know whether there were long-lived oceans um, which could then have maybe supported the development of life. But the thing I was going to go to is that people often say, well, let's learn about the way Mars was in the past because that will help us learn about why it changed. Why did it become cold and with a thin atmosphere and basically dead as we look at it today and dry? Um, you know, can we learn lessons from that about how the Earth might change if we continue to screw up on climate change? That I actually don't think is a very good reason to go to Mars. I think Mars, to understand it for itself, um, is is the real the real story? You know, it's a fascinating planet. Why did it change from being wet, warm, and and, and uh, with a thick atmosphere to the way it is today? But I think the lessons we can learn about the way the Earth is changing due to climate change, we study that right here. We study that on the Earth. You know, anybody who's been watching over the last 12 months uh, or two years will see that China has made enormous advances um, in its uh, exploration to the moon and now to Mars. Um, it's To some extent you can say it's repeating what has been done before, uh, although it had the first spacecraft on the far side of the moon and nobody's done that before. Um, so it's already do doing unique things. But it's the rate of progress which is enormous and it's very hard, I think, to be able to say yes or no to that question because 
now you're involving humans and that's different. Chinese have had, of course, um, astronauts or taikonauts as they call them, and they currently have astronauts in space today on their new space station. But they will face the same challenges that we all face when it comes to thinking about sending humans to Mars. And that's human biology and how you can cope with uh, a nine month journey far from Earth with the radiation environment outside of the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and it's not only physiological, but also psychological. How do you keep people uh, together over that period? And how do you make sure they're ready for potentially going down to the surface of Mars? So we're working hard on that. We're working on all sorts of uh, human biology experiments in low Earth orbit, on the ground, in Antarctica, to try to understand how to do that. And they will have to do all of that work too. So whether that's doable by the early 2030s, it may be. The technology-wise, launching a rocket there, landing it, that could be possible. But whether we're all ready to uh, send actual humans who can go and then bring them back, because I don't think any of the civil space agencies are thinking about a one-way journey here. Um, so I think there's a really good chance that they could do that. Yeah, I think they do. I think we've learned um, from the expeditions to the moon and from what the work the work we've done since with tele-robotics um, trying to command rovers from orbit and so on that having a human on the ground able to look around and use this brain that we have is this product of um, hundreds of millions of years of evolution uh, is an enormously powerful tool that we can't replicate yet with our rovers but I would say it makes sense from a scientific exploration perspective. I think it makes sense for us to go as we have gone to Antarctica, as we've gone to other places, to the, the depths of the ocean, or the Challenger Deep. You know, this is not a location particularly for tourists. It's a place to do scientific experiments. Um, so going to Mars is something which I think we should do and can do in a decade's time or whatever time scale it takes. Uh, would I make a one-way journey to Mars to go and live there? Absolutely not. Uh, it's a, an absolute hellhole. Um, you know, if you want to have the experience of, of, of going to Mars, uh, the experience, not the idea of, yes, I'm on Mars, not on Earth. Well, you know, if you want to have some idea of what, what it would take to live there, spend six months in Antarctica um, and six months in the Chilean Atacama Desert, but you're not allowed to breathe anything um, other than bottled oxygen during the time because, sure, you could go to Antarctica and breathe, you go to the Atacama and breathe, but Mars doesn't even have oxygen to breathe. Um, it's a thoroughly unpleasant place. Uh, it's also radiation streaming from space means you probably have to live underground the most of the time in a small metal box. Um, you know, the, the idea of growing food there just by digging the soil up completely misses the point about the way soil works on Earth. Uh, it's full of nutrients, it's full of minerals, and, and it's full of life. And Mars doesn't have any of that. So this idea that you can just go there and start setting up a garden and start living there and having a comfortable life is utter nonsense. I mean, Mars really, really doesn't want human beings to go there. We can because we know how to survive on places like the moon, but that doesn't mean you want to physically go and live there and spend your life out there. So no, I have absolutely no interest. I would go, I would go if I could come back and it was it was close to, as close to guaranteed as maybe the moon missions were. I mean, my, my kids have grown up now, I could risk that. But to go there and live and spend the rest of my life, absolutely not, no interest whatsoever. I mean, anybody who's you know been around this planet will see how, how utterly designed and how utterly beautiful it is for us. In the, designed, I don't mean in a spiritual, religious sense. It's just, it's where we're from. Everything here is, is set up for us take us to Mars we just don't belong there in any meaningful way and uh, so yeah it would just be an utter misery I think you know let's let's first address the topic of colonization I think colonization is a really bad um, a really bad model I mean colonization on planet Earth has been a dreadful experience for people who get colonized and for people who are the colonizers you know you end up going there as an indentured servant and working your way in a hostile environment and that's on a planet where there's actually oxygen to breathe there's water to drink um, and you could argue Mars doesn't maybe have life of its own but 
does it? If if life did have, uh, if that life does exist on Mars today, do we have the right to just go there and wipe it out? Where are the moral questions there? Yeah, it's a truly, you know, it's an ethical dilemma there. But let's say we establish that it's completely dead. There's absolutely nothing there whatsoever. It's just a, a, a dead rock. Um, then who should own it? Um, who should say that they want to go there and be the master of all the resources which then everybody else would live under? I mean, that just becomes a dictatorship of some form, whether a company dictatorship or an individual. Um, would we have the right to terraform Mars on the longer timescales? I mean, is that something we should do? I mean, if I said that I want to go and just, you know, fill in the Grand Canyon and, and build houses there, would you turn around and say, well, that's fine, you know, let, who cares about the Grand Canyon? Um, should we perhaps leave these places alone and, and not just view them as places for humans to go and make the same mess we've made all over this planet? Um, the, the one area which gets talked about a lot is this idea of it being a lifeboat to save humankind against disaster. You know, let's 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 become multiplanetary to make sure that this planet is not our um, our grave. And I just find this so philosophically confused and so philosophically pointless that I just don't think that, you know these guys that talk about this have really thought hard about what this even means. There are roughly 10 billion people on this planet, 8 billion today, 10 billion not very long from now. And if you could send a million people to Mars, that's one in 10,000, which means you and I don't know anybody that's going. I mean, I don't know 10,000 people personally. Um, so who is appointing who to go there? Is it going to be the rich people that can afford it? Are they the best of humankind that they should be able to save humankind? Or if we do it by lottery and say, look, well, we're going to send these million people, all paid for by everybody else, and they are going to save humankind, um, but you're going to, you and the 9,999 other people who are not going in your group, you're, you're all just going to have to live here on, on Earth and die. It, because that, you know, that's why we're going, right? We're going to save humankind. Earth must be broken. Let's go somewhere else. And, 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 and frankly, nothing we do to Earth will make it ever anything as bad as Mars is. So we will be much better off trying to survive here, whatever we do to this planet. Um, I just don't think that human altruism extends that far. I'm actually not personally very interested in saving the DNA of humankind. I'm interested in individual humans, the ones that I love, the ones that are my family, the people that I know, the people I work with. And I try to extend that as broadly as possible. But if you're going to tell me that, you know, one person from the middle of Utah is going and is representing humankind and is going to save me in some sense, I just don't think humans think that way. I just don't think humans would actually sign up to that. So, bluntly, I think they would say, screw it, we're all going to die here together. I'm not going to pay for you to go off to somewhere else to save us. I just don't think humans work that way at all. And I just, just really deeply dislike this idea that Musk and Bezos and Branson and the rest of them claim they're going to save humankind as if they're some kind of godlike figure. Um, it's, it's utter nonsense, I'm, you know. I'm sorry, I get quite angry about this because it's philosophical garbage. Um, and yet there, these people have so many followers and they say, ah, oh, but the sun will become a red giant in five billion years if we don't get away. It's like, really? Go and you know read some evolutionary history and try to understand biology because that's utterly meaningless as, as, a, as a point of view. You know, I think the chances have to be good enough that we're spending a lot of money and a lot of time looking for it. We know again that the the uh, the, uh, the Earth and Mars were much more similar when they were young, uh, and after all, life started on the Earth three and a half billion years ago. So it only became complex life like human beings and animals and even trees much more recently. Um, but there were small uh, microbes on the Earth three and a half billion years ago. Mars was much more like the Earth then. So it could be that similar forms of life formed on Mars. And maybe they didn't get any further. Maybe that's as far as Mars went in terms of evolution because it never went through the great oxygenation crisis. It didn't maybe have the, the same sort of um, plate tectonics and, and oceans that we have, which led to the development of complex life today. So I don't think anybody has any expectations we're going to find little green men wandering around on the surface. But maybe there's evidence for life having formed, and maybe, but maybe, it's still clinging on in certain environments underground. After all, we know on the Earth that once life has formed, 
it can evolve to survive in really, really strange and, uh, and, and challenging circumstances. So maybe it's there on Mars. Certainly worth looking. You know, the philosophical point about finding life somewhere else would, would, would approach this question of, are we alone? Uh, is the universe full of life? Uh, are there aliens around on planets around other stars? Uh, and you know, if you could find it on Mars, would that show that to be true? And there are sort of two interesting aspects there. So the first one is that there is a possibility, at least, that if we do find life on Mars, that it may actually have the same origin as life on Earth. And the reason for thinking that is that we know, you know, we, we talked earlier about going to Mars to get rocks back and bring them here to Earth and study them. Well, to some extent, we don't even need to do that because we already have bits of Mars on the Earth in the form of meteorites. So we know that the Earth and Mars are connected by big rocks hitting one planet, spreading small rocks into space, and then them hitting the other planets later on. So life could have traveled between the planets. Um, and so it would be interesting if we did find that there was life on Mars and it actually shared the same kind of structures as we have on Earth, maybe it formed in one place, or it maybe even formed on Mars first and then came to Earth. But that wouldn't answer the philosophical question about whether life can form multiple times in the universe. And that's the real big question philosophically. Can life arise twice? Now, the other philosophical aspect, which has a lot of people uh, intrigued, is the, the fact that even though life could be in many places in the universe, we're not hearing from it. We're not seeing it everywhere. We're not seeing aliens coming and visiting us from around the universe. It's the Fermi paradox. If life is common in the universe, where is it? Why aren't we finding it uh, widely spread? And this comes to this question, which is called the great filter. Um, what actually prevents life being widespread? Is it that actually it very rarely forms and that at any given time in the, in the Milky Way, for example, there's very little life? Because even though there's lots of stars, it's really hard to start life and then it lives for a while, but they never really overlap uh, life forms. Or if life is common and can form in lots of places, maybe the great filter is that it dies pretty quickly after it forms, or at least intelligent life, um, you know, and we know that. I mean, we've been at this kind of high technology game for maybe a hundred years. And we've, you know, we've come close to killing ourselves and maybe we will. So maybe when you get to a very technologically advanced civilization, if you're not, if you're not very clever, you may kill yourselves quickly. And that, that would be the other version of the great filter. And that's actually, the paradox is that if you find life on Mars and you find that it's different to life on Earth, and that means it formed twice in the same solar system. Well, that means life must be everywhere. Life must easily form everywhere in the universe. If it can form twice independently in our solar system, then it must be everywhere. And that means that the great filter is the other one, that civilization kills itself pretty quickly. So the, Nick Bostrom, a philosopher at Oxford, has actually you know, provocatively said, it would be a disaster if we found life on Mars, because that would then say that we don't have much longer to live. And that would be the way he would resolve the Fermi paradox. Now, there are other ways of resolving the Fermi paradox. And if anybody's read um, Liu Qijin's Three Body Problem science fiction books, they'll know that there's another possibility for resolving the Fermi paradox, at least another one. And if you haven't read those books, I would, because it's a brilliant idea, the idea called the Dark Forest. But anyway, you know, let's philosophically, let's go and do it at least. Let's go and look and then see what the answers are. Um, it would be a major, major thing to find life on Mars, but it opens up all sorts of other questions behind it.